Israel's assassination of a senior Hamas leader in Beirut has further raised tensions in the region. What is the possible impact? Ties between North Korea and South Korea seem to be worsening. What is the reason? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. On Tuesday, an Israeli drone attack in Beirut killed Saleh Hararuri, the deputy leader of Hamas, heightening the risk of the war escalating in the region. The act was harshly condemned by Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, who called it a major dangerous crime about which we cannot remain silent. He also referred to it as flagrant Israeli aggression. Now, Israel and Hezbollah have exchanged fire on a number of occasions since October 7th, but this attack in Beirut is once again in violation of Lebanon's sovereignty and might lead to a huge spike in tensions in the region. We go to Abdul for more. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Quite a few eventful days in the region as a whole, starting with, of course, the attack on the Hamas leader in Beirut. Could you take us through what has happened before we go into the response by Hassan Nasrallah? Well, on Tuesday, there were a couple of Israeli drones which basically flew over Beirut, uh, the Lebanese capital, and uh, exploded uh, on a gathering which basically killed four, uh, seven, of, uh, seven people, including one of the top leaders of Hamas, and since then, there has been a kind of, uh, uh, you can say, increased uh, uh, fear that there will be a, a greater is regional escalation because this is one, a violation of the Lebanese sovereignty. Israel has so far only attacked till the southern uh, Lebanon, claiming that this is uh, basically Hezbollah uh, has been targeting their northern borders and therefore it, it is uh, retaliating and so on and so forth. But this is like for the first time it attacked capital Beirut and that basically is one reason where, which basically has invited global concerns about uh, kind of a legitimate right of uh, Lebanese uh, and Hezbollah to retaliate the Israeli aggression. That is what of course on, uh, on Wednesday uh, Hassan Nasrallah, while delivering a, a speech on the occasion of uh, the assassination of uh, Qasim Soleimani uh, four years back, um, uh, basically said that, uh, referred to that assassination and claimed that Hezbollah will not be uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, will not be silent on this kind of uh, repeated violations of uh, Lebanon's sever uh, Lebanese sovereignty, and uh, kind of attempts to challenge Hezbollah's uh, kind of uh, Hezbollah's positions uh, inside Lebanon, and therefore uh, that that has also led to a speculations of a greater retaliation from Hezbollah. Uh, meanwhile, uh, of course, uh, Nasrallah also talked about how uh, basically the. Uh, Israel has been trying to drag Lebanon into the war, which uh, it is waging against the Palestinians in Gaza. And if it continues to do so, so the, the war which Hezbollah will wage will be a limitless uh, a war and uh, it will be very uh, costly for the uh, Israelis. So this is one thing, of course, apart from amidst all these uh, speculations of uh, greater escalation, uh, basically Israel has not uh, even uh, uh, become any uh, less uh, careful about provoking Hezbollah. In fact, there were attacks on Wednesday and early morning Thursday, which basically led to the killing of at least there are different reports, but uh, according to one report, four Hezbollah soldiers and destruction of much uh, uh, civilian property in different uh, parts of southern Lebanon. So it seems uh, uh, when at the one time and on one side, uh, US is saying that there should be a constraint, there should be no reason escalation. And in fact, the, it has deployed uh, one of its, uh, Biden has deployed one of his uh, envoys into the reason uh, uh, and uh, uh, expecting that he will be will be able to pacify the uh, this uh, you can say heat which was generated after Israeli assassination of the Hamas commander. Um, but uh, at the same time, Israel has not been uh, kind of uh, basically has not uh, stopped attacking uh, Hezbollah targets and uh, the people in southern Lebanon. 
Right, Abdul, could you also maybe take us through what is happening in Gaza right now? The offensive, of course, continuing, no signs of a ceasefire. Well, uh, uh, just to kind of add to what I was saying earlier, there, there are, in fact, when we talk about regional uh, escalation, we should uh, uh, remember that Hezbollah is only one part of it. There, in fact, today there are the reports coming. Sorry, uh, on uh, Thursday uh, afternoon there was a report that uh, Israeli, uh, sorry, U.S. strike has killed one of the commanders of PMF in Baghdad, which basically is another. So U.S., which basically is claiming that it wants to work for uh, kind of reducing the uh, heat uh, which was created due to the Israeli aggression, both inside Gaza and in Lebanon, is basically itself carrying out similar kind of uh, attacks. Which So uh, uh, one is confused. Uh, what is the objective of U.S. is? Oh, okay, as far as the... Um, the situation is Gaza in, in Gaza is concerned. Of course, the Israeli attacks continue. Uh, uh, hundreds of more people, in fact, have died in the last 24 hours. Uh, there are reports coming that uh, the human, one of the humanitarian agencies, the Red Crescent uh, headquarters, has been again attacked, and at least one health worker has been killed. Uh, there are uh, also reports of uh, various uh, casualties coming from uh, that attack. Apart from that, there is a, a ground offensive, uh, intensive ground offensive, which continues in Khan Yunis, uh, which basically uh, uh, leads to further uh, displacement of Palestinians. Um, and of course, the humanitarian situation is becoming worse and worse. And amidst all of this, there are two diff uh, specific statements which needs to be uh, uh, noted. Uh, which need to be noted uh, here. One, of course, is the statement. Uh, sorry, in report coming that some of the uh, Israeli legislatures are trying to kind of pass a, a kind of lobby for a discontinuation of the UNRWA funding and UNRWA work, which basically is you can say. UNRWA is the base of the humanitarian uh, program which is running inside Gaza at the moment. And if that stops, it would mean that there is a complete collapse of whatever remaining uh, signs of humanitarian work going on in, the, uh, in that territory. Uh, apart from that, there, are, there were statements made by uh, Israeli ministers talking about forceful exp expulsion of Palestinians from Gaza uh, in the last couple of days which basically had led to a greater uh, kind of, you can say, a fear among the uh, global community, among the Palestinians, and also among the regional players. In fact, the, some of them have reacted very strongly, uh, saying that such talks basically does not give any hope, and it basically leads to complete uh, establishment of the fact that Israel has no other objective inside Gaza but to completely ethnically clean that territory uh, to kind of build more settlements there uh, and kind of uh, uh, create much more uh, kind of delay the peace in the region forever. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for that update. The recent call by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to change the way his country deals with South Korea is yet another sign of rising tensions in that region as well. Now, just a few years ago, peace seemed on the horizon in the Korean Peninsula. But a change of government in South Korea reversed these gains and today, relations are steadily deteriorating something that suits the geopolitical interests of the US. We go to Anish to understand what's happening there. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, interesting and maybe even alarming developments in the Korean Peninsula. North Korea taking a very particular stand about, uh, you know, how, how it views reunification coming. And of course, there's a lot larger context to this coming after many months of very aggressive position taken by South Korea. So, take us through what is happening right now. So right now what we're looking at is a situation where uh, South, North Korea has probably set aside the whole reunification policy that was pretty much part of its, uh, you know, uh, its very fundamental policy of how it deals with uh, inter-Korean relationship. And this is not something that only North Korea has, both South and North has uh, the policy of reunification as the ultimate aim for any kind of relations that are being set uh, between the two Koreas. Now, uh, this re you know, removal of references from state media outlets, from, uh, from government information websites and everything clearly shows that there has been a very significant change in uh, position uh, under the current, uh, under the government uh, of uh, Kim Jong-un. 
and the leadership of Kim Jong Un actually. Uh, and the, this comes uh, just basically a couple of days after, or four or five days after uh, the uh, after Kim Jong Un made a statement saying that uh, reconciliation uh, and or even reunification is next to impossible right now uh, under the current circumstances. And this, we have to just wait and see how how far this is going to go, because uh, one of the red lines in that sense would be the fact that the North Korean government uh, starts uh, dealing with South Korea through its foreign ministry, and that would be a significant development. We haven't reached that stage, but if it goes that far, then definitely we're looking at North Korea uh, you know, treating South Korea as an enemy state at, uh, at the very best, actually. Uh, or uh, just giving up the entirety of uh, reunification as uh, an ultimate goal eventually. But uh, in this current scenario, this is quite alarming, alarming primarily because even if it's not reunification, keeping reunification as the ultimate goal meant that there was always hope for talks, for negotiations, for the peace process to come back in. And uh, the fact that it has completely derailed under the current government of Yoon suk uh, who has very clearly uh, stated his opposition to not just the North Korean government, but also any kind of attempt to reconcile with the government or with the North itself, and has made no effort whatsoever to actually talk to uh, the North whenever tensions were high, and has created situations where, uh, including uh, expanding military drills, joint military drills with the US and trying to rope in Japan into the entire mix, uh, clearly just aggravated the situation to the point where we are right now. And this, uh, because at, at, at its basics, the, the Korean Peninsula is technically an active war zone. Uh, there are, there's an armistice, there's a truce, but the Korean War never ended, technically speaking. So the fact that it could now be triggered, like the danger of it triggering back again into uh, an active war zone uh, would become, uh, is, is an imminent problem, might be something that we are looking at the horizon. And definitely alarming because a couple of years ago, we were already talking about peace, uh, you know, peace processes and, you know, probably hope of a sustained peace process that can actually last much longer than a couple of years or a couple of statements. And that was actually going to be my next question because it seems a long time ago, but it was just about five years ago or so I believe that, you know, it looked really, the possibilities for peace looked really, really high. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, few things that Donald Trump, one of the few positive legacies of Trump was actually what happened in that region. And now we are at the exact other end of the spectrum. Yes, uh, in a way, I mean, like I wouldn't give Donald Trump much credit because in a way it was pretty much the Moon Jae-in government administration in South Korea, which actually led to this entire process. And in 2018, we had the Parman John Declaration, which actually, uh, you know, called for an end of the Korean War, which was the first time that both, both the Koreas actually called for something like that. But one of the parties of the war includes the United States. And it was uh, while there were multiple negotiations and talks that have happened between Kim and uh, Trump, but uh, it never really materialized into anything because obviously U.S. domestic concerns often push their governments into taking more war hawkish stand. And you have Trump, uh, you know, kind of jeopardizing the entire process, even while Mo Jae-in was the president. It was only further aggravated under Yoon suk Kyol, and obviously Biden continued that. And this uh, situation is something that, you know, you can actually just see how, uh, you know, weak uh, the entire process, uh, eventually, how weakened the entire process was uh, eventually brought to, to the point where we are now looking at, uh, you know, probable war uh, in, you know, a couple of years down the line, if things do not really see uh you know or turn to the better uh very immediately and that uh, that that is something that is going that should concern everybody because east asia has, as i keep saying and we have always kept in uh, insisting has always been uh free of you know armed conflict for more than half a century now and uh, if it goes back to that situation it is going to be a big bigger disaster for the uh for the world because we are looking at technological giants, economic giants uh, in the region uh, who actually produce most of the stuff 
uh, for pretty much all of the world. And if they are being dragged into an armed conflict because of, you know, very stupid policies over time, uh, we are looking at uh, a problem that everybody should be very, very concerned about. Right, Anish, on that worrying note, we'll have to leave you and come back to you for further updates later. And that's all we have in today's debrief. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you.